think of that show? Yeah. I'm Tom O'Neill with Gold Derby. Meet the cast of Bates Motel. Let's start with Freddie first. Freddie Highmore. We have, we have seat assignments. Freddie here on the end. Vera Farmiga as Norma. And Nestor Carbonell as Alex Romero. So we knew that Norma had to die. We knew from the movie Psycho, if, if you've seen it, and you knew that the setup was here, and so it finally had to happen. But my first question is to you guys, did Norman have to kill her? Is Oscar Wilde right that each man must kill the thing he loves? Mm. Who wants to answer that? <laughs> well, she could have I think uh, been in a car accident, and, and, and Norman could have just you know, gone secretly and stole the body and stuffed her upstairs like we see in the movie, or she could have killed herself, and the love relationship. I, I, I'd to like to see Choose Your Own Adventure. I, I actually think they're, <laughs> they're in the uh, writing room right now, and I think it would be very interesting to have uh, a, a several, several um, scenarios. Like, like, why not? What if, Nor what if Norma killed Norman and Ooh. then took on his personality? I like that. And pretend I, I look great in a beard, <laughs> <laughs> even though Norman is clean shaven. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. You read your yeah. MSQ. What's it called? I would the love to see what happens if she, if Norma, just you know, got s just fed up with all this drama, <laughs> and just like awesome. rode off into the night Thank you. with. Um, she Man. should have actually. Much better this choice. wouldn't have happened here, you know. I'm really not sure she should have. Really? Okay, <laughs> tell us why. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that's the point. That's what Norman gets, okay. and I think he. <laughs> but Norman's right. We have this sort of vaguely, I guess it's a half jokey rivalry between the two of us. As to not joke, but <laughs> <laughs> as to who Norma should have, you know ended up being with. But I feel like Norman and Norma have to be together in order for both of them to feel complete and happy. And I think he's not that, you know, Romero has the best intentions, but I do feel that he's somewhat culpable for, for, what, for what happens. You are under arrest, says the sheriff. <laughs> Someone really believes their history. Up the, of what the no, it's interesting because we spoke with Carrie and Carlton, I, I know Vera and I did, uh, about this very episode and the end of it and the writing of the letter and 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 sort of the nuance of how much is she really, you know, committing herself to, to Norman and how much is she really, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, regretting this decision she's about to make, you know, and and really it's that beautiful scene that you guys have in the in the bed, that and the tone of that that what we you know you and I talked about, you know, are you are you the moving to Hawaii? Thought moving yeah, to Hawaii. Yeah. It's a beautiful yeah. scene. Yeah, I meant Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't code for anything. <laughs> Norman isn't the bad guy. Honestly, Norman is. You know, like, I was talking to Freddie the other night. Wait it's a, minute, a real wait a tragedy. I was talking to Freddie the other night. He goes, Norman's not a bad guy. If he was, he when he picked up that axe, he would have killed Alex. Uh, but he didn't. He held back, right? You you really That's believe true. this that Norman is not a bad guy? I do. I think I think I, I do. He's I think most people killer. agree with me. I'm not sure whether this is a joke that Norman isn't good or no, or he is. He, you know, he's he's, he's misunderstood. <laughs> no, but but. <laughs> His, his brain is misunderstood. He has a different neurology. Seriously, he does. He has, it's not firing on all cylinders. He has neurotransmitters that don't often connect in the right ways. You know, and... Talking about Norman? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, and certainly he's deluded. I guess what I mean is that it's an act of love, the last, the last thing that he does at the end of Nine. It isn't out of... It's what he genuinely feels is the best thing to do. It's not out of jealousy I don't feel in terms of wanting to get his mother back from Romero. I think he really feels that they will be happiest in moving on to whatever that new life will be together. I don't think it's a... Uh, and I do think it's a mis misunderstanding. Yes, I think he yeah, misunderstands exactly. my, my plea, that yearning for Hawaii. He, I think they are trying to find, you know... Yeah, I... And that's, that's, <laughs> that's why it's a tragedy, you know, it's not, it's, uh, 
It's an act of love. It's a it's a romance, and and Norman kind of gets that. I think in eight, you know, at the end of it, when he says uh, that huge speech in the in the dining room before he storms out, and then ends up with the axe in front of Romero. Uh, he he says, you know, don't you see that we kind of have to be together? And that's the the sad truth behind it all. I feel is that they need each other to feel complete. And I feel like Norman does have a good which is why he's been able to be more manipulative with people this season too, is that he understands humans very well. He's not, um, I just feel like I have to defend him. Yeah, but I, it, I'm just teasing but he, him. But he does understand the human interaction on a deeper level than, than, than other people. And in a way he's, he's right when he says they have to be, you know, it's, that, it's the horrible foreboding nature of Bates Motel that, that you know that's gonna happen. Nestor, why? Why does Alex save Norman? Norman? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> Were you crazy? No. Um. Well, I, I think, I, I don't know that he saves him so much as he, you know, he, he certainly right tends thing. to Norma first, absolutely. And, you know, uh, he's not going to you know, shed tears over Norman if he dies, necessarily. <laughs> um, only if Norma were to survive, and obviously her son doesn't. But no, I think he does it because, I, th I actually think he does have, have a conscience and and he realizes also that he is so dear to her heart as well and he can't just leave him in that room um so he would try but absolutely his heart is where where uh, where norma is um but uh no i think i think i mean look you make a very good case for norman i think you're <laughs> but i i uh i think i think the point you make about him being manipulative i think this season you're absolutely right he he's aware of of his own machiavellian qualities so i think he's less innocent um, you know, in, in the end. I mean, I think it's, it's really a manipulation. I think you're, you were wanting her the only way you can secure her in, in another world. You see, I'm not sure that the last thing is, I, I agree, certainly more manipulative. I just don't know whether it's manipulative when he goes into the room, into the bedroom at the end. I don't think he has a, this sort of ulterior motive. I feel like he gets lost in the moment and is genuinely... That was planned. I mean, that was... It's planned, but, I, but Semantics. it's... Semantics. But I feel like it's... Gen I, f I guess I feel like it's genuine. He's not... It's, it's genuinely not planned, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, you should be a lawyer, man. I'm telling <laughs> Let me ask you... We have a, an actor's group here. Let me ask you the actor's question, and that is, what is the hardest thing to do in your role? And, Freddie, when you and I talked about this yesterday, you gave me a surprising answer. I thought the answer would be, you have two great crying scenes this year. You have the crying scene in, in the hospital where you say to the doctor, let me go home. Why can't, and, it's just, and it's acting through the tears. It's not like directors cutting to your tears after you, after you guys do your lines. And the other one is in the, in the very, very final episode here, uh, uh, after this episode here. But your answer was not that. Your answer was the transition between Norman and Norma. Why is that the hardest? Yes, I guess the crying, it's always funny describing them as like crying scenes too, yeah. or like the emotional scenes as if like no other scene has a, um, I feel like those ones are more, I don't know, they're, I just don't find them as tricky. I mean, and they're so powerful, you know, like Nesta's moment at the end of this um, episode was so powerful and heartfelt and it takes a certain, you know, like quality and to, to like bring that out and it's so meaningful but I guess for me the uh, yeah those transitional moments and Norman that are harder because you don't necessarily understand them in your in your real life that you don't have something to connect to in oh I'm changing from this person into, into that person and I think it's making those moments believable and understandable as opposed to just kind of this flash of like Norman and then the next moment he's Norma and you want to see how that happens. Like in the fifth episode where he's up against the wall and he's breathing and the sort of camera pushes in behind and I think you need those moments of, of breath that Kerry and Carlton in the editing have been so great to keep this year as opposed to rushing it and sort of compressing what needs, what needs some time. Because it's got to be grounded in a believability that that people can latch onto and, and feel is real as opposed to, oh, he's just pulling a face and becoming Norma now. You know, you want to, you want to believe that it's, that it's actually happening and see how that takes place. Ira, what's your answer? Um, the, the most difficult, the most hard... So in other words, I would guess, I would guess yeah. in your case that the most difficult thing would be, let, let me pick a scene where the three of you are in the basement, all three of you, and I think it's the one time where I think Norma really believes her son could that your life was in danger, 
And at, at that moment, you come in right then and there and rescue the two of them. Uh, Norman, Norman is pinning Norma down and saying, mother, you, I forgot what the, what the story twist, but, it, what, it, but I mean, that was a good case of where this woman is, is juggling you know, the fear of her son, she's juggling the love, and she's thinking, oh my God, this, he's crazy, he's a killer, I know it, and now I might die, and you have to juggle all of that. And I, I, well, I think, yeah, tapping into that fear as a parent, I think, um, and I think this is a sure, she's been afraid several times to that degree, where she squashes that, that, that fear and takes on that maternal prowess that you need to say, I can still fix him, even though he may kill me in the next second. I still have a second to get there to change his mind. And, um, and I think that's what's so, her perseverance always, that maternal perseverance, like her ode you know, that she sings is always, you know, I, 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 I can heal him. I bore him somewhere within my DNA is, is the answer I need to, to be able to make him better and to fix him and, and, and things. That's what I always focus on. But I've been emoting for the past f four years, like Clytemnestron acid with, <laughs> with Norma Bates. And actually, one of the most challenging things, funnily enough, because in episode 10, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, I get to, to really sort of delve deep into rigor mortis. And it's actually very difficult to be still as an actor. I asked Vera on the way in here, can we talk about the, the, the scene there where uh, <laughs> Freddie pins, glues her eyelids open? That had to be, <laughs> as an actress, how do you endure that? You well, it's actually, it was, it's both, there's no glue in that oh, actual okay, okay. It was water. <laughs> we didn't it's, actually it's super glue <laughs> Vera's eyes. Yeah, <laughs> we did. <laughs> She's it was dead like, on the couch, and he's dug her up, and he's, and he's trying to keep mommy yeah. Ma alive. You know? Yeah, and uh, and he's just desperate to 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 look into her eyes one last, or to look into her eyes. At that point, he still doesn't. He's milliseconds from really acknowledging the fact that she's dead for sure. And uh, but that was a benign concoction of like holy water or something. And he just, <laughs> yeah. And so it, it, it was just me keeping my eyes open. In terms of a scene, I was, I was remembering just when you were saying with the eyes open and the whole journey through the house and keeping that sort of emotional journey right. I think that's tricky, you know, when it's effectively one scene and it's split up into various different parts when you film it. Like when you had that amazing scene with Max and it's, it's all one scene, but when you shoot it, you're going from the, the set of like the ground floor and then you have to move over after lunch and do the second and, it's, and keeping the yes. emotional arc of all of that. Yes, I mean, that's tricky so because there's different locations. It, yeah. We shoot the interior of the house in a soundstage in one part of Vancouver and we go out to you know, the countryside an hour and a half away on a different day a week later and do so that in keeping the emotional continuity of something um, in check is also can be challenging in the show. Esther, what's your answer to this? Um, I, I think those are great answers. I, for me, certainly in this episode, it was uh, just a matter of pacing on, on the scene where I rescue uh, Norma, or try to rescue Norma. Um, and then and just talking to the director and just saying, hey, listen, what kind of coverage do you envision here so I can pace myself when I break down? And, and then sort of just asking for a little bit of time from the AD, and, or just a heads up. So, you know, and then just knowing exactly where, where you're going to hit and also, you know, you, often there's a technical glitch or something like that. What, what you, <laughs> no, I know, and asking for complete stillness for me, because I have, I have ruined some of his ace takes, no. because I, I was sitting there trying to, <laughs> and he's, ba he's bawling, and his tears are like popping out and falling into my eye, and I'm, I'm trying not to move, but, you know, when these buxom tears from some, <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I mean, the pacing of it too, and, and also just a, a scene like that, you never want to, you don't want to play the end first, so, and there's a lot for, in that particular scene, because we had some physical stuff, getting the bodies out, and, and, you know, and, you know. A heavy guy to drag along. Okay. Easy, easy there, buddy. <laughs> now, Nestor, you're talking about the director, you actually were the director once, uh, and Freddie wrote an episode here, and now, Freddie's in the writing room now, and is going into the next season. And they're so you've taken on both of these other roles. I want you to talk about these things. Um, oh, it's been a gift. I mean, just uh, a do these guys will obey you when you give them. No, more they don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had the AD deal with them. Um, okay, okay. And we had the best ADs. You no. just sit in the you direct from the trailer. Exactly. Yeah, I don't, I don't talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> Pete White talked to them. Um, no, that was that came really from Vera. I mean, it was your idea that. 
I think you, you brought it up after season one or something. You said, you should direct. I don't know how you got that idea, because I never, I really never thought of it until Vera brought it up. We, we talk all the time about the, uh, about the anatomy of a scene, and he just has a way with words that I knew was going to, yeah, be very, very appealing anyway. for me as an actress, to, to uh, I, love, I love his enlightenment as an actor in, in our discussions about, you know, about scenes, and I, I just I knew it. Well, thanks, but it was, you know, we, we yeah, we would talk about st scene work and stuff like that, or just, you know, just objectives, and, you know, and we block it out often ourselves, so that came up, and Vera's like, you should direct, I said, well, I don't know, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't know the first thing about camera, but then I approached the subject with, uh, with Carlton, and he said, yeah, I think it'd be great, you know, so I, so I progressed to me shadowing, and then Carlton said, if somebody drops out, would you be willing to step up, and I said, Sure, and I was just dying inside because someone did drop out, and then I had to do it. <laughs> but thankfully, I mean, you know, these guys are amazing, and 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 so is um, so is our crew, and our incredible, the, the, our whole cast is. So the support I got was was phenomenal. No, but working with them, it was wasn't it weird the first day when I had to direct you? Though? It it's was weird, weird when you're in the sheriff's uniform. You know? <laughs> <laughs> hey. With like the big buckle out, and it's like <laughs> strut my stuff. <laughs> no, but wasn't it strange? Like the like our first scene that I had to direct you, I was like, all right, let's let's read it for us. I was like, <laughs> wasn't it? Freddie, you were an actually think, a uh, writer on this. Briefly, okay. sorry. Um, I think that Nestor also just gets it on such a nuanced level, which is what makes him so brilliant as a director. That he, and you can see it in the in the performance too. You know, in Romero's, like the slight subtleties that that he's always digging out and finding. And he brings that to directing too, of like incredibly specific notes, which is so useful. And someone who knows the show and the characters so well, who is able to pinpoint particular moments and try things slightly, slightly differently and give something incredibly specific. And it's, yeah, it was, it's been great. Uh, thanks, man. And as actors, I'm sure uh, you guys all relate. That's the only way I could approach uh, you know, directing you know, is the only way I knew how was was through the prism of an actor and, and then learned camera obviously from from everyone around me but I mean these guys are you know you guys are trained and incredible actors so it's so easy to talk to an actor in that way it's just great. Freddie you you took on a writing credit this season but you actually partially wrote this episode that they just saw correct or no? Uh, this no. is number nine right? No. no. Okay what was the, what the eighth one? Eighth one. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess in every, the collaborative nature of a, of a writer's room means that all of the writers, you know, when, you, when it says like, oh, this one's written by Freddie Highmore, it's sort of, you know, there's a certain cheekiness to it as there is with everyone's episode that's written by them because it's a truly collaborative affair. You know, you have the writer's room that goes on for months and every single writer has an input on every single episode. And so you go off and write your one, but you have very much your brief and the beats carved out, um, which is what makes it exciting, I think, working in, in television or as a writer, that collaborative nature. You know, it's not like pass the parcel, like, ah, here's episode one, just carry on and see what happens, which would be an interesting way to write a show. Um, but, but I guess for me, it came out of a desire to want to be involved in that, in the wider process and just finding it a little odd to put so much into a season and then go off you know back to England for a few months and then be like oh I see what you've done with the show let's carry on you sort of want I wanted to be um, involved through throughout and have you know I was lucky to have Karen Carlton who supported me in that when I was asking Freddie yesterday about the final season and his ideas a writer going into the final season he was he was focusing on how your character and I'm not sure anybody has the answer yet but how the how are you gonna we know from the movie that that Norma is a, is a great ghost. We hear her voice, we see from the very final scene of the very final episode, she's there, at least in his head, they're playing the piano, they're having, it's it, happily ever after as far as his d demented serial killer mind is. So we know you're gonna be there, and you're gonna be there, but different this time because it's not, it's not our Norma, it's his Norma. I don't know what to expect. I know it's gonna be different variations on the Norma theme. I think his psyche is fractured, and so you have all these splintered, visions of her and 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 and, I, I, and they know how to write for me they i think it's gonna be plenty of gymnastics yeah i do i'm excited i i don't know though i i know for a fact there will not be a resurrection she's not she's not <laughs> coming back from the dead i thought that's what you were pitching earlier that you actually had killed me no, yeah. <laughs> 
I wasn't pitching any one ending. I think it would be <laughs> funny for for fans to be able to be like, hmm, this is what I want to happen. Let's see, let's see that rendition of Bates Motel. Okay, we have questions from the audience. They've, they've uh, given to the, me your questions on cards. So from Roxanne Beck, we have the question, what was your most difficult scene from each of you guys this year, the most difficult one to do? Who wants to start? No. <laughs> Just on the technical level, I had to direct uh, our lovemaking scene. That was tricky. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. Uh, next. <laughs> I guess you fears yours with the teardrops in the eye or something. Mine uh, was um, a six-paragraph monologue, <laughs> a summation of my sordid history. And you know, the whole thing with Norma has been um, she. I think in order to achieve, she's had a um, a very painful past. And you know, what she's wanted to achieve this entire this entire journey is happiness and peace. And that would come a, uh, that would come about by by truth telling. And for her, I mean, there's two ways to go wrong with truth telling. You either don't start <laughs> or you don't finish entirely. You don't complete that journey. And I always wonder, oh, what would happen if, if that decision hadn't been made on Norman's part with the thing if, you know, I think she's come so far this year in enlightenment and the great beauty and grace that, that, that he's been a catalyst, he's been the sage that has shown up in her life and encouraged it with forgiveness and love. Say, I'm still here for you. Just, t you know, just say, just say the words, tell the truth. And I feel like, oh, things, you know, I feel like in many ways Norma it just needed a good rest and maybe the next day she would have, you know, she would have, anyway. But I think for me, there was a, there was a monologue, there was, I don't know, it was like four pages of, um, and it's, it's difficult because it's ex exposition. And you have to ride the emotion and the audience already knows what happened, so they're not learning anything new. But this character is. And, um, and so that was very tricky to navigate and take after take after take too because I, I tend to expire quickly and it's very challenging. I think I do. <laughs> oh, she was brilliant. I mean, I was the recipient of that and you were just, uh, that was, um, I mean, you, you made exposition. If you ever can read a phone book and it's entertaining, you know what I mean? And that was, that was, that was stuff you had obviously lived through as a character for years, but I had, wasn't privy to that information. But you made that so honest and alive that it was, I mean, that was like an acting exercise. It was incredible. Thank you. Freddie, what's your answer? I guess there was something tricky in the in the tenth episode in um, because it's new and fresh. You know, there's the novelty to adjusting to life post Norma and keeping the humor there in in an episode that you know it's it's it would be dull if it were just like Norman crying the entire episode or having it, you know you didn't want it to be one note and finding the differences in every single scene and obviously so much of that was in the was in the writing and of this deluded sense of him thinking that she's gonna, well actually proven right, that she's gonna come back to him. Uh, but it's, it, it was new, I guess. I, it was sort of moving forward with the character and putting it into a new situation and position. So that was, that was trickier. A question from Camden and Felina. This is for you. Freddie, and that is before being cast as Norman, had you seen Psycho, the movie? Uh, was it intimidating taking on the role of Norman Bates? Yes, no, I, I had seen Psycho and the funny um, remake of Psycho too. Oh, wow, yes, um, yes, yes. <laughs> it was just a really interesting, bizarre exercise, isn't it? Like redoing the whole thing, except he masturbates in one scene instead of, um, <laughs> it's just kind of weird, isn't it? Uh, but fair play, well done. Um, the, and then, uh, and I guess there was a certain pressure, but by having it in the contemporary setting, I think there was a freedom to move past or, or not needing to stick rigidly to what was there before. And, you know, being inspired by 
Anthony Perkins' amazing performance, but not feeling like you have to mimic it and become, by the end, you know, the exact embodiment of, of him, because that would never really work. You know, you have to do it in your own, under your own terms, yeah. Or what was your familiarity, both of you guys, with the film? The, and, and did you take anything from it? Of course, Mama's dead in the film. You could, you could do whatever you want with her now. Yeah, <laughs> I, I could. Uh, I, I didn't feel there was anything I could take necessarily from that. I was a different kind of sheriff, I think, in the film. Um, <laughs> but I love what Carrie and Carlton have done with, uh, you know, obviously taking great liberty and, and reimagining the whole thing and really just taking this dynamic and then adding a brother to the mix. Um, but still tipping their hat off to Hitchcock, even just uh, the death of Norma. In the film, he, it's, uh, the backstory is that he poisons uh, his mother and her lover. But technically, I guess, he would consider himself her lover. So in a sense, they're sort of tipping their hat all the time. I think that will be fun next season. I'm always so wary of talking about things in the future, unless I've heard either Carlton or Kerry say something, in which case I feel like I can repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> and they've made reference to the fact that there might be this, um, you know, that the events of Psycho might come at some point in, in season five and that there'll be a, you know, sort of reinterpretation of, of that mythology, which will be exciting. Hitchcock was once asked what uh, is his formula for mystery writing, and his answer was, was so great because it applies in a bizarre way to this whole series. His answer was, always give the audience knowledge that the actors don't have. So in other words, you're watching a horror movie and you're going, don't go in the attic, no, oh my God, just don't do it. And so he said, that is more important to empower the audience with something that they don't know. And the whole idea of this series is that we know where it's going to end, we have that foreknowledge. <laughs> and so here you are, you know, uh, we have actors struggling to get there, and it's, it adds that extra wonderful dynamic that he considered the hallmark of his writing. Uh, anyway, my aside. Uh, th this is, let's, ask, let's go to Stephanie Walters, who says, how hard is it for you guys to disconnect from your characters during your time off? Because, come on, you, got, you have these really psychologically intense characters. I really don't find, everyone thinks I must go mad, but I don't really go mad, do I? I'm kind of... <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't think so, anyway. Okay. I kind of... Um, Maybe you're just like that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or you use it as a... I mean, there's something cathartic in, as I'm sure, I hope you, you would agree, in, in like the scene, like in real life, when you have a good cry, you sort of feel a bit better afterwards. Not that acting should be a form of therapy, but that, that there is something... You know, you get out if you have, I don't have a tendency to kill people in my real life. But maybe if I weren't playing Norman, then suddenly I'd be like, oh, I've got to take this out on someone. Um, but no, but there is like, by having a shout and a, and a cry on set, you kind of go home feeling a bit more relieved at times, as opposed to feeling <laughs> this like pent up energy. Okay. Except when this one's still around and then the rivalry continues. <laughs> My immune system gets compromised. Every single year at the end of it, I get sick. I get the flu, full blown, yeah. It, it, it manifests physically, yeah. You're getting a flu shot this year, aren't you? They don't work on me. Come on. <laughs> uh, Nestor wants, oh, this is a question for Nestor. Your relationship with, with Vera's character has changed over the seasons. How has it been playing that range of emotions? Um, it's been amazing, and it's rare. We were talking about this before we came up. Um, it's rare on a show that you, you have a sense of where a, a relationship is going to go necessarily. And Carlton did, when, I, when he asked me to, to join the show, he said, listen, something will happen at the end of episode, at the end of season one, that will launch your relationship with Norma in a different way. You know, we were sort of at odds for a whole season. And, then, and he said it will be a lot of sort of one step forward, two steps back from there on. And so that dance, that tango that we've had for you know, s several seasons, we knew was going to finally sort of boil up and, and actually be co consummated. Um, but we didn't know how. But I love what the writers did this season in that they, they sort of, uh, it was always, again, it was always tiptoeing. It was always, well, let's, let's do a marriage of convenience just to physically be together. And then we'll consummate it physically through passion and then eventually we'll declare our love. So it was always a bit backwards. Alex it's always knew when she proposes to you that you always knew she was in love with you and that you were in love with her and that it was going to go there. At what point in your storyline throughout all these four seasons does Alex fall in love with Norma? I think when he, when he goes to her house and she doesn't let him in when he asks her about Keith Summers. 
I think when in the first season, I think he's already smitten. He feels like he's met his match. And, and this is a woman who's come here with her son, taken over a motel, and clearly doesn't uh, jive with the town. And he's like, well, this is my girl. Even though his deputy got there first. <laughs> What's your perspective from Norma's side on, of the relationship with Alex? When you propose to him, is she in love with him? No, you know, th she's had a... <laughs> it's a l <laughs> You know, she hasn't had the best experience with men <laughs> in her life. And, and so I, I don't think it's until, I really, there is an undeniable attraction repulsion, um, an undeniable magnetism, even from season one, I think. They're always, but I don't think it's until, I don't think it's until the proposal. I, I mean, the, the wedding ceremony yeah. where you, sh yes, where you show up with, a ring. That's the nicest thing that you could have done. Just men aren't nice to her in that way. I think I think it took a long time. I don't think that No, I think it did. But I don't you think it was that I thought it was even later for you, maybe. Even know. later, yes. The falling in love moment is yeah. I think for me when he when he um when he hears my story and he says uh he says so I say go on, go go tell me to pack your bags and he says where are we going? <laughs> I think it's that moment. Very, right now you are in another acting vehicle across, in theaters across America called The Conjuring 2. And uh, Freddie, <laughs> Freddie mentioned it yesterday and I was asking him because we were at a party yesterday. And he said, um, we were just really hanging out all day. Hanging, actually, we did an interview like, too, so we had a lot of time to talk. We sat in here alone, just going, <laughs> right, right. going through all the, like, testing so we the jokes. We rehearsed so. all these, these <laughs> topics before. So I, my question to him was, is Bates Motel really a horror? Uh, uh, story and he, and and he said no it's not like Vera right now she's in a horror story The Conjuring Two is in theaters that's a horror story Bates will tell us wasn't that aggressive about it or like critical <laughs> I think it's brilliant about the point, right? <laughs> <laughs> no but there is a I I think when you see the co when because I saw the and Nestor as oh well, we went along to see The Conjuring Two and it's brilliant and it's a brilliant horror film but when people describe Bates Motel as a horror film it's I just I don't think it is. It's not. They're, they're, no, they're it's so horrifying different. events happening yeah. to to real people. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a psychological thriller. But I think yeah. the Conjuring Family too. Drama. I think the yeah, Conjuring gets into that world too, more of a psychological thriller. Even obviously, it has you know horror elements, but it's not your typical genre. It's it's a really smart film. It's a really great film, not just a genre piece. Yeah, and you dig out the. Well, you, you know, we you think you're you're amazing, mother. <laughs> I love when he calls me mother. <laughs> it just sneaks out sometimes. It's like, oh dear, whoopsie. Um, yes. <laughs> so I guess it does stick with me a little bit, you know, sometimes. Okay, here's our last question. Take us behind the cameras. Uh, what, what, what is it like on set? Uh, it, are one of you a practical? We get along very badly. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're never joking. <laughs> You know, what, what are some stories of, um, I don't know, the, a hurricane goes, goes through town, the, the set falls down, something that, that was a real challenge as actors that you suddenly had to face that went, when it went off script? Off script. Um, it doesn't necessarily go, this, the script is so precise, the right, the, you know, the right is so precise. So I, I think nothing, I think between us it can get sometimes like <laughs> we've drawn closer and closer and closer you can't have a lukewarm attitude you either when you're playing these roles you're either going to love each other or you're going to hate each other <laughs> and and i think the uh, with every year we just draw nearer and dearer to each other he's a part of my family and um and we can push each other and push and we know each other's buttons and so Sometimes, so especially in the last two seasons, mm -hmm. I feel sometimes when, when, it, when it gets super contentious, he knows how to get under my skin. What does he do in or say? Well, first of all, he'll drink like 10,000 Coca-Colas and, and it <laughs> revs him up. <laughs> and he just, just by the, just that, just that frequency for me, the caffeinated frequency for me is a lot to bear. And he will pace in front of me. But then it's just little remarks. I, I, I it's, <laughs> I've blocked them all. It's just little. I think it's nice when you get to know someone so well that you feel the freedom to, to like, to, as yeah, you say, punk. like, <laughs> no, but push each other's buttons yeah. and to feel like, like the rivalry with, 
with with Romero too this year that you that it can sort of extend in a jokey way off off camera too because it helps the scene and it also underneath it all you know that you have such a strong real relationship that you're not messing anything up it gives you a freedom to really commit to those scenes when you're in conflict with one another without fearing what the other person's thinking or without fearing that they're judging you or misunderstanding you or very true i think your points both your points are great the the level of trust that we have is because we're really good friends and and add to that the writing that we're so lucky to get to to, to work with you know and the crew i mean we're this, hands down this is the best job i've ever had i mean and, and consider i mean i consider myself extremely lucky on every level but um but yes that that trust that that allows us to go to sort of darker places um, also allows us to take chances, and even when we physicalize it, and, you know, and, and fight scenes, we know we're going to get hurt. <laughs> Someone's going to get hurt because we're going to go for it, even though we plan it and we try not to. Some, so he's not here to tell the story, but I know Max in season was it three? Season three, when Norma leaves uh, in episode six, you become Norma. You've got the robe on in that <laughs> yeah, kitchen right, scene. Right, right, right. And you start going nuts, I think, when he challenges you and you start throwing plates at him. Oh, yeah, I did throw. So why don't you, you were there, why don't you tell the story? Because I saw it in the editing room. That I was throwing the plates. You were throwing plates at him and, and, and Max was there, you know, Yeah, well, you've got to make him really yeah, duck. Really you know, right. there's no much point, like, throwing it half-heartedly. He's got to get out of the way. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, they weren't real plates. It wasn't like I was really going to somehow decapitate the guy. <laughs> but you do, you know, it's like a fun little, like, ah, yeah, see if you can get out of this one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the challenges of an actor. On that note, thank you all for coming. You're all award voters. This deserves lots of them. Keep it in mind. Thank you. Thank you.